Hello, my name is Josiah Jones. I'm the rector of Holy Trinity Reformed Episcopal Church, and I know many of us have been, uh, during this time of the pandemic, of uh, the coronavirus, of COVID-19, we've been uh, considering what it is that uh, we should, as Christians should be doing during this time. How should we respond to this particular crisis and this pandemic? And of course, one of the things that we have rightfully been saying and rightfully been doing, I pray and hope, has been praying. But one of the questions that can come up is, well, how should we pray? What does it look like to pray in light of a pandemic, in light of um, a, a time of great sickness? And we have in the prayer book tradition, many wonderful prayers to help assist us during this time. And today I'd like to consider a couple of those prayers. We're very briefly today going to consider uh, the prayer that we at our parish at Holy Trinity have been praying very often throughout through this pandemic. Um, it's the prayer that's found in the 1928 Book of Common Prayer um, on page number 45. Um, this prayer uh, for in time of great sickness and mortality. We've been praying this prayer very often uh, in every worship service we've had, and I've also commended to the parish to be prayed uh, daily as well. And I hope that those of you who are members of Holy Trinity or affiliated with Holy Trinity, I hope that you have been praying this prayer. I think it's a very wise and good and helpful prayer for us. Uh, this prayer from the 1928 prayer book, we're going to talk about, like I said, uh, briefly here at the beginning. Um, we're going to spend most of our time today talking about uh, a book, uh, a prayer that's from the 1662 Book of Common Prayer. That's not in the 1928 prayer book. It's very interesting that there are um, uh, prayers uh, in times of great sickness uh, in the 1662 book um, that actually trace all the way back to Cranmer, as we're going to see. Um, we have this prayer here that was actually written for the 1928 Book of Common Prayer most likely um, by those who in their memory uh, remembered uh, and had lived through the great flu pandemic of 1918 and uh, wrote this prayer uh, very largely, I, I would suppose, in response to that. It's interesting that some of the modern prayer books, the 1979 Book of Common Prayer, even the ACNA's uh, most recent prayer book, which is wonderful and excellent, um, it does not have a prayer um, in time of plague, or in time of pestilence, or in time of great sickness. And probably that's because, of course, we haven't had an event like this one uh, for uh, about a hundred years. And there, there are very few people who in living memory remember a, a plague or a pandemic like this one. Um, and so very often our prayers uh, can be formed by our experience, right? And so uh, it's wonderful that we have uh, uh, many hundreds of years of experience uh, as Christians before us of how they have responded to experiences like this, how they've responded to times of great sickness um, and times of plague, how they have responded in prayer. So this uh, prayer, uh, like I said, probably in response to the 1918 plague, uh, was most clearly in their mind when they wrote this prayer to go in the 1928 prayer book. O most mighty and merciful God, in this time of grievous sickness, we flee unto thee for succor. Deliver us, we beseech thee, from our peril. Give strength and skill to all those who minister to the sick. Prosper the means made use of for their cure. And grant that, perceiving how frail and uncertain our life is, we may apply our hearts unto that heavenly wisdom, which leadeth to eternal life, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The REC, Book of Common Prayer, has a very similar prayer on page 65, which adds these excellent words at the beginning of the prayer, O most mighty and merciful God, to whom alone belong the issues of life and death. Of course, that prayer follows much more closely the typical collect form, where in the invocation there's a, a, an address to God, which we say, that you are the God who does this, right, or who is like this. And so we remember in that prayer, God is the one to whom belongs the issues of life and death. We flee to God for succor, that is for help, in light of a pandemic, in light of a time of grievous sickness, because God is almighty. He's the mighty God and the merciful God, and to him belong issues of life and death, not to us. And of course, this is a time that is uh, very difficult to remember that. And we'll talk more about that when we talk about the next prayer that challenges us even more in those ways.
But this prayer very wisely goes on to pray that God would deliver us from our peril. You know, we pray for those who are helping the sick. And of course, we remember the doctors and nurses and those who are, are serving those who are sick during this time, who are putting their own lives at risk to serve those who are sick. We pray for them. We pray for a cure for the illness. And then we also pray that we would be wise to use this time. In other words, that all of us would understand that from our perspective, life is frail. From our perspective, we don't know what the future holds. And that is the fact, uh, no matter what prognostications we may read online about how this situation is going to affect the coming months or coming years ahead. I think everybody agrees that it's going to affect the coming months and years ahead. But no one is exactly sure how, despite many confident predictions. We're not to make necessarily confident predictions. We're to understand from instances like this that we don't know what tomorrow holds. And because of that, we ought to apply our hearts to the wisdom that God gives, to heavenly wisdom, the wisdom that leads to eternal life. As Psalm 90 says, which this prayer references, Psalm 90, verse 12, teach us to number our days, that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. We need to number our days. We need to apply our hearts to the heavenly wisdom that leads to eternal life, that heavenly wisdom of the gospel, that Jesus Christ has died on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins, that he has risen again on the third day, that he has ascended to heaven, where he has gone to prepare a place for us, that he has poured out his Holy Spirit on his people, that we might live lives of joy and obedience and faith before him. All of these things we trust, uh, these things are heavenly wisdom that we ought walk in in this time. And yet there's another prayer that we're going to spend uh, most of our time together today thinking about. This is a prayer that's from the 1662 Book of Common Prayer. It's quite bracing. And so I'd like us to spend some time thinking about it today. The prayer goes, O Almighty God, who in thy wrath did send a plague upon thine own people in the wilderness for their obstinate rebellion against Moses and Aaron, and also in the time of King David did slay with the plague of pestilence three score and ten thousand, and yet remembering thy mercy did save the rest. Have pity upon us, miserable sinners, who now are visited with great sickness and mortality, that like as thou didst then accept of an atonement, and didst command the destroying angel to cease from punishing, so it may now please thee to withdraw from us this plague and grievous sickness. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. A quite bracing prayer. Um, a prayer that uh, is filled with scriptural imagery, but also filled with imagery that I think for many of us is discomforting, uncomfortable. God in his wrath sent a plague to his own people. God in his wrath could send a plague. What does this mean? Well, it's important we think about this. Like I uh, said on that uh, the header of the first screen, what we pray, the things that we pray say a lot about us. And this prayer uh, from our tradition, which is much neglected today, does have something to teach us about how we ought to pray and how we ought to respond when we face times of pestilence or times of plague. So as we think about this particular prayer, this prayer was written in most of its form by Archbishop Thomas Cranmer, who was, of course, the translator and architect of much of the Book of Common Prayer. And in 1551, a disease called the sweating sickness swept through Britain. This was a disease that popped up again and again um, in the 15th and 16th century um, in Britain. 
And this sweating sickness was devastating. It was a contagious disease um, that, as its uh, name um, sounds, it was involved in its later stages, uh, breaking out in an awful sweat. And it could often be fatal. And Cranmer uh, wrote this prayer, um, particularly in this situation, in light of a pandemic, in light of an epidemic, at least, in Great Britain, in light of this awful sweating sickness that was sweeping through the nation. And so the, most of the prayer is, is, uh, is found uh, from Cranmer, but as part of the prayer uh, comes from the 1662 Book of Common Prayer about 100 years later. Bishop John Cozen um, added the phrase about Moses and Aaron and atonement. So what that means is if we go back here to the prayer itself, uh, this phrase, um, who in thy wrath did send a plague upon thine own people in the wilderness and for their obstinate rebellion against Moses and Aaron. That phrase there was added um, in the 1662 Book of Common Prayer by Bishop Cozen. Um, the rest of the prayer, um, save this part here about did accept of an atonement, which relates back to Moses and Aaron. The rest of the prayer uh, is from Archbishop Cranmer. And one commentator on the prayer book, a fellow named John Blunt, says um, this was done to raise the objective tone of the prayers here and elsewhere, making our address to God of a more reverent and humble character. In other words, Bishop Cozen was seeking to um, to deepen the scriptural imagery that was used here um, in the prayer, to deepen the scriptural imagery, to, to give it a further humble character of prayer. And of course, a humble character of prayer is something we want to cultivate. We want to cultivate humility in our prayers. But the question is, what sort of humility is this prayer inviting us to? Why does this prayer have the particular imagery it does? Well, let's go sort of line by line, or rather section by section through the prayer, and let's think about the scriptural imagery and some of the ideas here that are found in this particular prayer. It begins, O Almighty God, who in thy wrath did send a plague upon thine own people in the wilderness for their obstinate rebellion against Moses and Aaron. Who in thy wrath? This is an idea, uh, uh, particularly an attribute of God, God's holiness, um, his anger against sin, which is here called his wrath against sin, uh, which particularly discomforts us as modern people. It's not something we're very comfortable with. And many of us have the idea that God is, uh, is good, yes, um, but his, his main purpose is to make me feel good and to make me feel comfortable. And when we read these sorts of ideas, and indeed this is, a, as we're going to see, a very scriptural idea that God has wrath against sin. When we read these sorts of things, when we pray these sorts of things, it can be very discomforting for us. And I know that because I'm a modern person too. But we need to remember God is the Almighty One. He's not a man like we are. He is almighty. He's the creator. He is indeed filled with wrath against sin. Now, even as we say that, and we, as we think about God's wrath or his anger, it's important we understand that his anger is not like our anger, or his wrath is not like our wrath. God is not split between wrath and love, or between holiness and love. As one uh, commentator, theologian, Michael Horton, puts it, God's wrath always expressed his wisdom and judgment, and even his love, which along with his other attributes have been accosted by those whom he created for love and to love. A being who is perfect in goodness and love must exercise wrath against sin, evil, hatred, and injustice. In other words, God's wrath is not capricious. God's wrath is not random. God's wrath has a reason, and the reason is human sin. Now, we also must, of course, in remembering that God is filled with wrath against sin, remember that God in grace sent his son Jesus. In other words, God didn't only send a plague. 
God sent his son, Jesus, that God himself, God the Son of God, was made incarnate so that God's wrath would be propitiated, would be satisfied, so that it might be turned away from mankind who had fallen away from love into sin. But even with that, we're reminded here that God still takes sin very seriously. He has a reaction to it. And in the Old Testament, we read that God did send a plague. This is a very biblical idea. As one uh, Bible encyclopedia puts it, uh, there is no question in the Hebrew or New Testament mind that plagues are part of the judgment God sends to individuals, to families, and to nations. God himself threatens to send plagues to the Israelites in proportion to their sins and takes full responsibility for the Egyptian plagues. The Old Testament plagues demonstrated God's control over the processes of nature, just as do Christ's miracles in the New Testament. Now note, this is not to say that every time a bad thing happens to a person, or every time a person gets sick, or every time a person has cancer, or every time a person um, uh, has a calamity in their life, then that is, strictly speaking, some specific punishment for a specific sin in their life. We see in the example, for instance, of Job, who had not committed a specific sin, and yet had great calamity come on him, including great illness that came on him. That it is not the case that when bad things happen to individuals or the bad things even happen to, to, uh, to people that we would say, oh, well, here's the exact thing. We, we know that you must have done this thing and that's why this other thing happened. Right? Um, we've talked uh, several times before at Holy Trinity um, about the example of, um, of uh, when the people came to Jesus and said to him, um, uh, you know, the, the tower, they wanted to talk to him about the tower that had fallen on people. This is, I believe, in John chapter 13. When the, power, the tower had fallen on them and, and Jesus said, do you think that they were worse sinners than anyone else? That this happened to them? And he said, no, they weren't. And then he said, but yet, you ought repent when you see that this calamity has come on people. Or similarly in John's Gospel, when uh, they came to Jesus and said, was this man, or was this, this man's sin or his parents' sin that caused him to be born blind? And Jesus said, neither. But this happened that the glory of God might be shown in him. So it's important that we understand here that it's difficult for us when we're faced with particular circumstances to draw a direct line to say, oh, uh, well, this bad thing is happening here. Therefore, we can clearly reason backward to say, well, therefore, we know that it was caused by this particular sin. At the same time, Scripture is clear about what sin is. And scripture teaches us that we ought to be wise to notice that God does notice and God does act in this world. And that there are, in fact, sins for which we ought repent when we are faced with calamity or when we're faced with difficulty, when we're faced with plague. We as moderns, when we're faced with something like this, we look for scientific explanations, right? And we have good scientific explanations. This is not a non-Christian thing to do, to look for scientific explanations. We should look for scientific explanations. Uh, people are exploring about, you know, what, what the virus is, how the virus causes this, uh, how the coronavirus works, and, and looking into this and researching um, uh, uh, cures. And, of course, we would pray in that first prayer that, uh, that God might prosper the means made use of for cures, for these sorts of ills, for illnesses. But we tend to merely look at scientific explanations. We count numbers. And I know many of us spend time on various websites looking at various graphs and various numbers to try to, to gain an understanding of how the coronavirus works or, or what the best response would be, what we think the best response would be of the government or what we should be doing to respond to it. 
And this is a very modern thing to do. This is what moderns do. But we also have to understand here that there is um, there's another there's another uh, vista, so to speak. There's another another thing, perhaps the most important thing. And that is there's a spiritual element to what happens in the physical world. We're going to talk more about that in a minute. That God can actually send a plague in the physical world to teach us something both both physically and spiritually. So the first reference we see here is to Numbers chapter 16, verses 41 to 50. And I'm not going to read the whole passage, although I do recommend that you read it, particularly if you go on to pray this prayer um, after um, for your reference. But in Numbers chapter 16, there's a great plague that comes upon uh, the people of Israel in the wilderness. This is directly after a man um, named Korah. Um, and um, some of uh, some other people with him had rebelled against Moses and Aaron in the in the wilderness, and in so rebelling against Moses and Aaron had had also been rebelling against God in the wilderness. And the people of Israel, instead of seeing God's judgment, which had come against Korah as um, as God's wise judgment, uh, the people of uh, the congregation of the children of Israel, this is number sixteen forty one, murmured against Moses and against Aaron saying, ye have killed the people of the Lord. Um, and it had, of course, not been Moses and Aaron who had killed anyone, if you go back and read in number 16, but it had been an act of God in judgment against Korah. And um, as a result of the people's murmuring and the people's rebellion against God's judgment, a plague broke out in the congregation. And yet there was God in mercy provided a way for the plague to be stayed. In other words, all of the people who were murmuring deserved, based on God's judgment, to be punished for the crime that they committed of rebellion against God. But God, in his mercy, stayed his hand. There is an atonement made. Um, And this atonement that's made is uh, found in verse 46. Moses said to Aaron, take a censer, put fire therein, and uh, from off this altar, and put on incense, and go quickly into the congregation. Make an atonement for them. For there is wrath gone out from the Lord. The plague is begun. And Aaron took as Moses commanded, and ran in the midst of the congregation. And behold, the plague was begun among the people. And he put on the incense, and made an atonement for the people. And he stood between the dead and the living, And the plague was stayed. The plague stopped because of this atonement. In other words, there was this this atonement is um, is represented by the his censer and the incense, which we find in Psalm 140 and other places in Scripture represents the prayers of God's people. Then Moses, as high priest, stands between the plague and the people who are healthy, so the plague stops. And this is a a type of Jesus, right? A type of Christ who stands between the living and the dead, who who makes atonement so that those who are with him live, that they're they're forgiven of the sin for which they should have plague. They're forgiven of the sin that should lead to death, but are instead given life. So this is a very, uh, it's a wonderful uh, image here of God's grace, and it is also a sobering image of God's judgment. That because of sin, God does indeed judge. And then we have further here the second reference in the time of King David. We pray in this prayer, did slay with the plague of pestilence three score and ten thousand, and yet remembering thy mercy did save the rest. This is the second reference in Second Samuel chapter 24. Second Samuel 24, we read that God had been displeased with Israel. And because God was displeased with Israel, he aroused David to take a census. Very mysterious passage here, but this is Second Samuel 24. And again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he moved David against them to say, Go, number Israel and Judah. As the story goes, um, David goes to take the census. His general, Joab, is like, uh, no, this is a bad idea. Um, They've been commanded in the law not to take a census. 
But David is determined to take the census. He decides to take it. He takes it. And then God's judgment comes against Israel because they had not, uh, David had not passed the test, so to speak. He had gone along and taken the census and was held responsible for his actions. And this uh, gets at something that's very, uh, very mysterious idea in Scripture, but something that's important for us to think about, particularly as we think about this coronavirus and other sorts of viruses. And this is a, a doctrine that's sometimes called concursus. In other words, that God works within means, yet he holds his people responsible for their actions. So when we think about uh, this uh, coronavirus as a whole, right, or COVID-19, right, is caused by a coronavirus, it's a particular means which is used. And yet God um, is the Lord of heaven and earth. He could uh, destroy all the coronavirus in an instant. He could cause it to mutate so that it was no longer harmful. He could do so in an instant. And yet he doesn't or hasn't yet, even as we pray that he would turn aside this from us. And so this doctrine of concursus also goes with human beings. God determined to judge Israel and to test Israel and to test David. And in fact, uh, David did not pass the test. And David is held responsible for his action. That God worked through this action to bring judgment against Israel. God was displeased against Israel, and so was bringing judgment against them. And so David takes the census, and David is judged for that. And David as king, when he is judged, the people of Israel with him are judged. And as the text goes, um, after they take the census, um, uh, David is given uh, three choices three things that can happen. Gad the seer, this is in verse 11, 12 and following. Uh, Gad comes to David and tells him there are three choices he can choose from that is going to be the judgment. Shall seven years of famine come unto thee in the land? Or wilt thou flee three months before thine enemies? Will they pursue thee? Or that will there be three days pestilence in the land? Now advise and see what answer I shall return to him that sent me. And David said unto Gad, I am in a great strait. Let us fall now into the hand of the Lord, for his mercies are great. And let me not fall into the hand of man. So David puts himself and Israel in the hands of God because he understands if he falls into man's hands, there won't be mercy. But in God's hands, there could be mercy. And that's why in this verse here, we, uh, or in this prayer, we have, and yet remembering thy mercy. In other words, God did slay in judgment with the plague of pestilence three score and ten thousand, seventy thousand. And yet, remembering his mercy, saved the rest. God put himself and Israel, or David put himself and Israel in God's hands, trusting in God's mercy. And the plague indeed went out. It lasted three days. But then it was stopped. It was stopped at a man named Aruna's threshing floor. And we're told that David bought that threshing floor and that that place became later the site of the temple. And this is very instructive and important for us to understand. In scripture, um, illness can sometimes be uh, the result of God's judgment. Sickness, whenever we are faced with it, is a result of the fall. It is a result, generally speaking, of sin in the world. And we as human beings living in a sinful world of course, are prone to, to illness. But when this, this plague was symbolizing the judgment of God against their sin, and it stops at this threshing floor, the angel, we're told, is stopped at this, uh, at this threshing floor. The plague is stopped. And this is the place where the temple is then built. And of course, this is very powerful symbolism of the fact that the temple will be the place at which Israel's sins will be forgiven. And of course, this looks forward to the New Testament and that Jesus comes and says that he is the, that his body is the temple. Right? His body is the temple. He says, tear down this temple and I'll rebuild it in three days. Right? That Jesus is the one through whom there is forgiveness of sins. And then further, the church 
is called the temple. We're being built together, right? We're living stones, spiritual stones, Peter says, with Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. The church is now the place where is found forgiveness of sins in and through Jesus Christ. But the fact is, this threshing floor of Aruna, very important in symbolizing all of these things. And these are the things that are brought to mind in this prayer. So we've had the beginning part now where, again, we, we've invoked, right? We've, we've spoken about the things historically that God has done, that God has brought plagues, but God has also remembered mercy and shown mercy in the midst of plagues. And so then we ask him to show mercy on us, have pity on us. This is called the petition. This is now where we're asking for something. Have mercy on us, have pity on us, miserable sinners who are now visited with great sickness and mortality. And this idea that we're miserable sinners doesn't necessarily mean a psychological misery, right? Again, in the modern world, we're prone to interpret all of these words psychologically. We interpret them all as, well, if we're miserable, that means we're really down. And I think that the feeling of unhappiness is not necessarily foreign to this context. But the word miserable can also mean a pitiable or small or unable. And so partly this idea that we're asking God to have pity upon us miserable sinners is we're asking God to have pity on us who can't help ourselves. In other words, who we're, have pity on us. We, we need pity. We, we desire pity. We're unable to help ourselves from this great sickness and mortality. We need your help. We need you to help us. We need you to save us. Because we're visited with this difficulty, with this great sickness, and visited with death. And then we f further continue in the petition by actually going back to those two passages that we referenced. The like as thou didst accept of an atonement. That's in reference to Aaron, right? And Aaron's atonement for the people, the prayer and the incense as a sign of that atonement. And it's command the destroying angel to cease from punishing. So it may now please thee to withdraw from us this plague and grievous sickness through Jesus Christ our Lord. The request we make is grounded in the fact that God is almighty, that God is sovereign, and that God has in the past turned aside plagues. That he's brought them, but he's also stopped them and turned them aside because he's full of mercy. That even as he is just, he's merciful. And the fact that we ask this through Jesus Christ our Lord is incredibly important and instructive. We ask this by virtue of the fact that Jesus is our head and that he has died and risen again. He has gone before us. He has died for our sins. And so because of that, we plead that God would see us as members in corporate in his body. We pray that because of Jesus, that there would be no condemnation for us. And that this plague and grievous sickness would be withdrawn from us. So, it is a sobering prayer. And I think as we think about this prayer and think about some of the things we've talked about today, it's important we make a couple of applications, or at least think about a couple of applications from this prayer and from some of the things we've talked about. First, I think it's important we notice that this whole situation we're going through right now challenges how we think about control and how we think about how much of our lives we actually really control. I would submit to you that control and desire for control is a, a central human desire but it's also a particular idol of the modern world. We just think, I mean, I, I think all of us, uh, you know, would have been prone to think three months ago, you know, uh, plagues, pestilences, they just don't happen anymore. If you weren't an epidemiologist, perhaps. You know, these things just don't happen anymore. I mean, they, they could happen, but it, these things don't happen. I mean, we have such good sanitation, such good medicine today. It, these things aren't going to happen anymore. The way that they would happen periodically in the ancient world, in the medieval world. Um, even into the modern world, in the early modern world. 
we don't have as much control though as we think we have. That's why that phrase from the REC prayer book, the, the things of life and death pertain to God, they are his things, are important reminders for us. We need to remember that we're not actually in control. That God is actually the one to whom these things appertain. He's the one who's in control. And if he's the one who's in control, then he's seeking through these things to teach us something. To teach us wisdom. To teach us to not value secondary things, but to value the things that we ought to value. The things that are best for us. The things that are most important for us. And those things, of course, are faith, hope, and love. And we need to be sensitive to hear that. And to give up that control even as, of course, part of giving up control doesn't mean we just throw our hands up and say, well, there's nothing I can do. I'm not going to do anything anymore. No, it, it doesn't mean that. right? God calls us to faithful action in light of the fact that he is king. That he's sovereign. Now further, I think that this situation calls us to repentance. One of the things the 1662 prayer does so well is it reminds us of this. That God can send these these illnesses, plague or pestilence, in his wrath because he is aroused against sin. That sin is not just an indifferent thing to him. That sins of abortion or homosexuality or greed or oppression or pornography or any of our other besetting sins are not merely indifferent to him, but that they are in fact sins that arouse him, that are, are sins of stealing, are sins of neglect of the poor and neglect of the needy, are sins of backbiting and gossip. These things arouse God. And that we in the church are called first to repentance. We're called ourselves to turn away from these things and to set our hearts on heavenly things. We're to turn away from these sins and look to God, look to Jesus, look to him in repentance, both for ourselves and for our nation and for our world. One of our responses to this, a further response to this entire situation, must be prayer. It must be prayer. And these prayers from our tradition give us a good pattern of prayer. They teach us good things that we, to, we are to pray. That we're to look to God in the midst of us and see that he's the one who holds life and death in his hand. That he's the one who can turn this away and so we should look to him. That we ought to repent as we do this. Remembering that God, in fact, is active in the world today. He's not removed from the world. He's active in it. And therefore it appertains to him to remove judgment. We also pray, of course, for those who are serving the sick. We pray for the deliverance of the sick. And we pray that we might set our hearts on the things, the, the things of wisdom, the things that really matter. That we might, above all, seek our Savior. That we might, above all, seek him in faith. We remember, one of the things we remember, even in light of all of this, is that if we are in Jesus, if we are baptized in his church, if we are trusting him in faith, if we're following him faithfully, trusting in him for our salvation by his grace, not by our merit, but by his grace. We have confidence that he is with us, that he has a purpose for us, even in the midst of difficulty, that he will never leave us nor forsake us. And this is a great comfort, that he walks with us in the midst of whatever we face, he walks with us in difficulty. And in fact, because of his promises, because of what Jesus has done, that he will see us through. That even if the worst possible thing were to happen to us, that he would still be with us, he would see us through. And that even if we were to die, 
that our souls would go to be with him in heaven and that when Jesus comes back our bodies will rise to the resurrection of life and that we will dwell with him forever in the new heavens and the new earth and this is indeed great comfort so even as we think about the sobering nature of these prayers and the sobering nature of what is all around us and our deep need for repentance in light of what is around us we also are reminded and taught that if we're in Jesus there's great reason for hope for even we remember that with David he showed mercy with Moses and Aaron he accepted the atonement and that God has provided the means for atonement for us and he's provided that means in Jesus Christ so let us follow and trust our Savior now and all of our days Brothers and sisters, if you have any comments or questions um, about this, I'd be glad to talk with you more about these ideas, more about these prayers. I'll send these prayers out um, to those in our parish that you might be using them regularly. You can also find them online. You can search for the 1662 prayer or the 1928 prayer. You can find both of those online. And I commend them to your prayers uh, through this time. I pray that God would bless you and keep you now and always. Amen.